Hello, hello. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship today. Glad to see all your lovely faces. Welcome online as well. If you're watching live or later during the week, drop us a comment. Let us know you are here. You can also text hello to 727-732-3550 to get connected with great things going on here at Oakhurst. Ask any questions you may have and go deeper with the church. Pastor Nathan today is continuing our series on modern monsters. This is the final week of this particular series, and we're going to be exploring addiction. So I pray that this is a space for you to come to worship, to grow, to be challenged and encouraged. So as you are able, actually, let's not stand yet. I believe we have a video. <laughs> I came to the children's home in 2007 after my mother had died. Um, our church stepped in and placed my brother and myself here. Who <laughs> knew that when Ashley would grow up, that she would end up being a part of our independent living program and working right alongside of me. She had just came to us on the hills of losing her mom. My heart was just so torn up over the grief and what this child was going through. My therapist's name was Kathy. She very quickly became one of my favorite people on campus. Um, she inspired a lot of what I do now. I really liked participating in rec. I really liked that they had tutoring because academically um, it helped a lot. So with chapel, we uh, got to go around various parts of Florida. We would perform um, at different Methodist churches in the area. Um, that was nice because we got to meet a lot of nice people. The children's home actually shaped um, who I am now as a person. Um, the position is working with the alumni. And then the other set of people that I work with are youth who are still on campus. And I really like working with them as well because they, they, I think they don't always see the potential that they have, but then I get to come in and say, you know, I did live here. I do know that what I'm teaching you is valuable and you need to know it. So I hope that maybe, even if it's just like one kid, Maybe they make different choices than they would have if I wasn't in the picture. Thank you for all that you do. It helps give kids like I used to be a chance to succeed. I'm 
will follow you. God, your love is enough. You will pull me through. I'm holding on to you. Amen. 
For those of you who have been with us, either in person or online throughout this series, you'll recognize that last week when I talked about domestic violence, I had referenced that song, so thanks to the band for playing it this week. Uh, It's about bringing your brokenness, and I'll bring mine, allowing love to heal the divides and the hurts and the pains that are within us. I invite you now to join me in hearing from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 12 and 13, our scripture reading this morning. So if you think you are standing, watch out that you do not fall. No testing has overtaken you that is not common to everyone. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tested beyond your strength, but with the testing he will also provide the way out, so that you may be able to endure it. Let's pray this morning. Almighty God, as we gather together in this time and space to reflect upon your word, as we've come here together to hear from you, to listen to your story, intersecting with our story and and creating something even more beautiful than what we could do on our own. Lord, as we gather in this space, we do bring our own hurts and our own brokenness. We we bring our fears, our failures. We, We bring our past with us. And we bring those we love and hold dear in our hearts with us into this space today. What we've talked about over these last four weeks, Lord, these modern monsters, we pray. We pray that you would give us the strength to face them. The courage to come alongside others who are facing them right now. The space within our hearts and our congregation to embrace our community in these vulnerable spaces and places. So, Lord, do your work within us and among us, flowing out from this place. And during this time, give us eyes to see your will and hearts filled with courage to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if you've worshipped with us for some time, if you've followed along and caught up on our past catalog of worship services and messages that are on YouTube, where you've you've been here for a number of years, you may have heard me talk before about uh, this person, but J.D. was someone that I went to high school with. J.D. and I were, were not really friends, we were acquaintances that sometimes hung out. You know, you have a lot of those in high school. As you've become an adult, I have found, you have less and less of those, the acquaintances you just kind of hang out with, Right? But but J.D. was kind of an ancillary part of my core friend group for a number of years. And and there was a tipping point at which I said, I'm not hanging out with you anymore. And that was when a bunch of my friends came over, and I've I've told pieces of this. We were uh, engaging in some backyard wrestling, right? Because, you know, we thought we were going to make it to the WWE, right? They just had a big show last night, so it's top of mind. Um... We thought we were going to make it there, and so we were smacking each other over the head with two-by-fours and chairs and trash cans, and it was great. Oh, my gosh, it was so much fun. Um, But J.D. had to leave early, and and that's fine. You know, I had to leave early from some of our our gatherings as friends and and our hang sessions. Uh, He had to leave early, and we found out that uh, about an hour after he left, my other friend said, okay, you know, the street lights are coming on. It's time to go home. You remember those days? Those were good days. It's time to go home. So they went outside to, to get on their bikes and pedal home. Some of them lived in the town over the viaduct, quite a long ride. Some of them lived like three blocks away. And when they went outside, every one of their bikes was missing. There was like five bikes there. When, we, when they got there, and there were zero when they went outside. And they came back in, and they said, Nathan, your mom stole our bikes. <clears throat> I said, 
search our house top to bottom, guarantee that's not what happened. So they did. And they're like, we don't know how she did it, but your mom stole our bikes. No, she didn't. A couple weeks go by, and my friend Greg comes up to me and says, I want to apologize to you and your mother. Uh, your mom didn't steal our bikes. JD stole our bikes. And I know that because I saw him riding my bike. He brought it to school today. What an idiot. So, you know, our friend group sat down with JD at lunch and said, Hey, buddy, why'd you steal the bikes? I didn't steal them. Absolutely you stole them. No, I, I don't have them. We found out later, years later, that what he did was he stole the bikes and then sold them to neighborhood kids. Right? But he liked Greg's bike, so he kept it. That was the start of JD's journey towards theft and more unsavory practices. I don't want to say the end of his journey because there's more, but the end of that journey, where that led to, was JD getting arrested for breaking and entering, theft, and possession of illegal substances that he had been hooked on and was stealing in order to pay for his habit, right? This all happened here in Florida, by the way. So he'd come down to Florida where it was warm and he could sleep outside and steal from people and, and fund his drug habit, his addiction. And sadly, sadly J.D. went into prison and, and it was rough. And there were churches that would come in and he'd be like, he'd look at them across the table as they're trying to evangelize and go, if I walked into your church today, you would turn your back and you would clutch your purses and you would not want me there. So why should I listen to what you have to say while I'm in here? Because I'm a captive audience? That's JD's personality, right? Like, that's just who he is. But... Over time, there was one particular person who came in and kept inviting him to their chapel service every time they'd, they'd run it. And he'd be like, so if I came to your church, could I go to worship? Absolutely. A lot of people that get out of here actually come and live in a house near us, and we've got a service filled with people who used to go here who have made a new life for themselves. And, and yes, absolutely, we'd love to have you there. Okay, so if I got out of here, you'd hire me and give me a job if you had something open. Well, we wouldn't disqualify you from it. Okay. So he checked it out, and eventually he did get out of prison. He did go to that church. He did turn his life around. He found a, a woman there that he started dating, and they got married, and they've had two children now. The church did hire him. He's the director of their rehab services, or he was, and... I think he got promoted recently, so he oversees more. We understand this is, that drug addiction is a problem, right? Like, we get that. We understand that. I don't know. I don't want to ask you to, but I'll raise my hand. I have plenty of family members who have struggled with it, and some of them who have lost the battle with drug addiction. I've got that in my family. So we understand that it's a problem. And, and growing up, in my childhood, which is not as long ago as some people's childhood in this room, but it's not exactly yesterday now either. But growing up, and, and the rates may have changed, but the, statistically, when I was a, a youth, there was no difference between rural and urban hard drug use percentages. The difference was the drug, statistically speaking. So this is not a problem that we can say, oh, well, that's in, you know, that neighborhood down there, right? And sometimes we kind of say, well, that's those people's issue, and that would never impact us out here. You know, I was in a, a small town that we were in, where the JD and I grew up in. That was the attitude there. This problem will never get to us here, because we're a, a close-knit, upper-class, white-collar community. It'll never, never happen here. And then the, um, the daughter of the Presbyterian pastor overdosed and died. The police chief's daughter overdosed and lived. And I could count on, well, 
all of our hands together, the number of alumni of my high school that I know of that died as a result of a drug addiction in that town. So no, it happens there. The only difference is which drug, right? So we know this is a problem. And we know if we've paid any attention to the news or if we've heard uh, anything about this problem, that opioid addictions have often been triggered by prescription drug use, right? A doctor prescribes a drug and you need it for the pain, but you don't need it as long as you take it and then you can't get off it and then you need something else. Right, and that happens all the time, too. So we know that that is also an issue that's happening. And so we know that these are big issues in our community. We under, you know, so deep down, if we've ignored it, we still understand when we talk about it, this is a big issue. But the question is, why should the church care about this issue? That's really the question, right? Because you might not be able, you'll find some, but you might not be able to find as many verses in the Bible about drug use as you do domestic violence and sexual abuse, right? You won't necessarily find that. So what is the, why, why is this an issue for us? Why should we care? I'm going to get at that from a different angle. There was a study done in the 70s. It's become known as the Rat Park Study. I don't know if you've ever heard of this study. I imagine that maybe Dawn has actually read this study or parts of it. Uh, but the Rat Park study is where one group of, of sociologists had read a study that said if you put a rat in a cage and put two bottles of water in there, one that's regular water and one that's laced with opioids, it will always drink the opioid water until it overdoses. And the sociologist said, well, yeah. If you put a single solitary rat by itself in a cage that has nothing else going for it, it will always pick the drugs. But what happens if you put a rat in a societal cage where they have as much food as they want, as much interaction as they want, as many toys as they want, where maybe their little girlfriend rat also is, right? Where they're surrounded by a community of rats, then what happens? So they did that experiment. Not a single rat overdosed in that cage. Not one rat. Now, there were rats that would go and drink occasionally from the opioid water. In fact, they think most of them took a drink or two from that water to test it out. But and it's not something unique about rats, right? It's not like they have this stronger potential to um, resist addiction because the previous study said that every rat will overdose. But what was it about those rats in Rat Park that changed things? Well, they started looking at it. They had entertainment and friendship, you know, as much as rats can. They had love, you know. They had uh, support and distractions. They weren't isolated by themselves. They didn't feel numbness and pain constantly, it, it seems, like the isolated rat did. And so uh, they said, well, we wonder if this is true. Now, we can't go around, right, locking people in a cell and giving them two choices for water. You know, we can't do that. We should not do that. We should not do that. We, we can't then take a control group and and, and, you know, we, we can't do that sort of testing. But what we can do is look at things in the past that have happened, right? We can look to the past for some of these sorts of things that we could, could really study. And they, they found a pretty close parallel, they think, these sociologists. They, they extrapolated out from there to see if humans were similar. And they looked at Vietnam War veterans the ones who admitted that when they were in Vietnam, they used opioids regularly. And they studied what happened to them when they came home. You'll never guess what happened. The ones who came home to a loving family structure where they were part of a community and supported, very few of them, not, no, not zero, but very few of them ever went back to using in the States. The ones who came home and were told you have to make it on your own, and there wasn't a support structure, and they 
weren't treated well for their injuries, right? They didn't feel listened to. A great many of them wound up going back to using opioids and living on the streets. And the difference was, like in the study, were they left alone in a cage? Or were they part of a community? And so it is not 100% foolproof, but there's a strong correlation between them, right? Even, even so strong that you could say that one thing helps cause or not cause the other thing, right? Correlation and causation aren't the same thing, but, but these are linked. And so if there's a sociological component to addiction, I would tell you there's also a spiritual component to addiction. And I'll tell you this after a lot of study on the subject. There's a spiritual component to addiction. And as spiritual, I don't want to say counselors, but spiritual guides on people's journey, one of the terms we use for that is attachment. That we people in, in the midst of addiction are attached strongly to something other than God. And they're attached to something that destroys the image that we talked about this last week. If You can go back and watch it online or if you were here. Last week, that destroys the self-image of God within them. The more that I need this substance to make it through the day, the less I feel like I'm created in the image of God. Because God could resist this temptation. You know, when Jesus was in the wilderness and he was tempted, he resisted, right? Well, obviously, I can't resist. And it just gets worse and worse and worse the deeper and deeper you go. There's a spiritual component to this. There's a spiritual hurt and brokenness, a shattering of, of that image of God that, that happens in the midst of this as well. Today, in the scripture, we heard these words. So if you think you are standing, watch out that you do not fall. No testing has overtaken you that is not common to everyone. So that's the first thing I want to say. None of us, I don't believe, from being in these communities, none of us is immune to the potential of addiction. By the grace of God, perhaps we aren't. But none of us are immune. And because this testing is common to everyone. Every creature on earth, if left in its own cage and given the choice, would probably take the opioid water. Every creature on earth, every human on earth, probably would end up there. It's a common testing. God is faithful. This goes on to say, though. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tested beyond your strength. Now, I don't think that that means your individual strength. I don't believe in the cliche that gets said in churches a lot that God will never give you more than you can handle. I don't actually believe in that one, and I don't think that's what this says. Because I think, I haven't done the word study, so I can't tell you I'm right, okay? But I think when it says your strength, it really means your plural strength. Right? Your strength is the body of Christ. Your strength. But with the testing, he will also provide the way out so that you may be able to endure it. It seems to me that because we have call, been called by God, created by God to be in community with one another, that that is part of the answer to this problem. You know, Pastor Phil made a really good point this last week that I had almost overlooked for this message, but we believe in the God who exists in community. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If God exists in community, we can't possibly believe that we don't need to. We are created for this. Now, you might be an introvert to the nth degree and say, I really don't like other people. But go away from other people for six years and you'll figure out real quickly that you kind of did need them. Right? Right? That there's some form of community that is healthy to each of us. Relationship that we must have. And it's because that's a strength God has given us. To be together. 
to adore it together. If God is providing a way out for people in the midst of addiction or at risk of falling into deep addiction, then it is through community that God is providing that way out. It's through love, it's through grace, it's through support, it's through accountability. It's not through stigma or distancing, and it's not through the proverbial clutching of the pearls, right? Every once in a while in, in churches that I'll preach at or that I'll go to and, and maybe that I've served before, never this church. Never this church. Every once in a while, someone will walk in. And I'll hear a leader come up to me and say, do you think they're on drugs, Pastor? Should we lock all the doors and hide the women and children? Maybe not that bad, right? But you get the point. And I say, well, we don't want to be stupid, right? You don't want to be unsafe. I'm not going to give them the bank vault key. I'm not giving them the password to our online banking or a church credit card right this second when I, they just walk through the door. But what if we just embrace them? I get it. It's dangerous. I understand. But what if we just made everybody who walked through the doors feel like they had a place in our community, in our fellowship? What if, what if instead of being the churches that visited J.D. in prison that admitted to him, no, you could not walk into our church for worship on a Sunday morning, what if we were like that church and said, we'd give you a shot, sure, you could maybe get on staff here. You're definitely welcome in worship. we got a lot of stories like that. What if we were that church? And, it, you know, it's interesting because J.D. got out, and J.D. got his life around, and he got into an NA group that was really good for him, and he was going through the 12 steps, which I believe in very strongly, partly because Methodists started 12-step groups. Probably didn't know that. It's part of our DNA that we're supposed to be involved with this. And one of the steps was to call people that he had wronged. So he called me one day. I was still pastoring in Pittsburgh at the time. He called me one day and said, Nathan, first of all, I want to say I'm really sorry for stealing your friend, our friend's bikes and telling everybody that your mom did it. I said, well, we figured that one out a long time ago. You know, it wasn't a secret. But thanks, because the second thing I want to tell you is thank you. Because we had these backyard wrestling things in my house a lot, and J.D. had been involved a lot. And it, the way most of them ended, and that he was escaping that day, was that after everybody was so beaten up that they could not move, I'd pull the Bible out and start having a Bible study. It was my little bait-and-switch operation. J.D. says, you spoke words that I have realized were words of life into me, even though I knew at the time you didn't like me. You always let me come to your house until I stole the bikes. And you always spoke words of life to me. I want to thank you for that. Because the person who came to the prison to invite me to church reminded me of you. That's why I went. And so I want to thank you for that. Now, I'd like to tell you that um, we're best friends right now and that things have gone swimmingly in life, right? But what I will tell you is that I love the way his life has turned around, right? The same characteristics in him that I really didn't care for when he was a sober teenager, I'm not real fond of still, and that's okay. But I'm quietly cheering him on that his life is going in the direction it's going. That he's got two beautiful children, he's got a fantastic job, and he's helping other people turn their life around. As he said to me at one point, I think if that person hadn't walked in, I was going to be dead the next time. 
Because I had robbed some pretty dangerous people. And I had done some pretty dumb stuff. Our calling as disciples, as the people of God, as the community that bears Christ's name, is to not turn away from or run away from or hyperbolize or shriek at the modern monsters in our midst, right? We can't do that. The common theme running through all four of these messages is this. We have to be willing to have these conversations, create these spaces in our congregation that people struggling with who have experienced these things can come in and feel at home. We have to connect with resources that, that, that help people through these monsters and, and these, these breaking down of the soul moments. And we have to be a source of accountability and support for them. Non-judgmental accountability for people going through these things and all these situations. Because the truth is, and I don't got to tell you this, the world is a messed up place. It really is. It's completely and utterly messed up. And it's made up of broken and fallen people who do bad things and to whom bad things happen. And the secret is, a lot of them are already in our church. A lot of us are already here. Oh, we don't share it, we don't talk about it, we don't necessarily make space within ourselves to deal with this very well. But we're here already. So why not accept and understand that our mission is to call people back all people back to a deep understanding of the image of God, the image of Christ that's made and can be remade within us. We are called to be the ones to stand against these modern monsters and to help people who enter into here turn the tide in the battle that they're facing, if it's in their mind, in their relationships, within their own bodies. We are the ones called to help them win that battle. It's our strength together that does this. And maybe the person that we help the most is going to be ourselves in the process. Let's pray. Almighty God, we come before you today. We are so grateful that you've given us this spirit of freedom, this spirit of release from the chains of our minds, our bodies, our relationships, the ones that hold us back from experiencing the fullness of your spirit and presence in our lives, the ones that want to keep us down and captive, those, those hurts, those addictions, those struggles the ones that tell us we're not good enough and we'll never measure up, so why bother? Lord, you want us to confront all of that, not just within others, but also within ourselves. Draw us back into a place where we understand we were created and formed in your image. And so was everyone else. And that it is our calling to reconcile all people to you. We pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Let's worship along with our praise band. Keep fighting voices in my mind, they say I'm not enough. Every single lie that tells me I may never measure up. Am I more than just the sum of every high and every low Remind me one
once again just who I am because I need to know You say I am loved when I can't feel a thing You say I am strong when I think I am weak You say I am held when I am falling short When I don't belong Oh, you say I am yours And I believe Oh, I believe What you say of me Well, I believe The only thing that matters now Is everything you think of me In you I find my worth In you I find my identity mm, You say I am love When I can't feel a thing You say I am strong When I think I am weak You say I am hell When I am falling short And when I don't belong Oh, you say Taking all I have and now I'm laying it at your feet You have every failure, God, you have every victory oh, You say I
Amen. Well, friends, a few ways that we can continue to connect and really, in a sense, continue to keep what we've been talking about in this series alive. And one way is for you to know straight up, you are not in this alone. You have a community of people who cares about you. And one of the great ways to connect with the community is with our Coffee time. So Wednesday morning at 9 a.m., Pastor Nathan and I go to Southie Coffee, and we would love for you to meet us there, to have a coffee. If you're online and you say, hey, I can't go to Southie Coffee or I don't live in the area, we'd love to have a virtual coffee with you. Heck, I'll even send you like a Starbucks gift card or something. You can buy the coffee on your end. We'll have coffee on our end. We can talk about whatever you may have going on. Next Saturday, August 6th, we also have Patricia Lorenz coming in. We have an event here at the church, 10.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. Everyone is welcome. She's going to be talking about hearing God's voice. This is a great space to get to know other people and learn about God speaking in your life. So if you'd like to go to that, we do have forms to fill out to RSVP. Um, That's going to be a really great weekend. Then a couple ways that you can help support our community. Um, One is if you look in your bulletin here in person, Online, you can find this information under the Donate button and then going down to the Methodist, uh, United Methodist Children's Home. This is the video that we showed at the beginning of the service. You can give directly to that using that envelope here today or giving online. And then finally, next weekend, August 7th, is our Backpack Sunday. And so we are helping bless some of the local schools with supplies that kids are going to need for the school year. Lots of people working behind the scenes on that, which is amazing. But if you would like to give toward that, there's information right over there by the backpack. You can also talk to Don, who's here, or Gary. Um, Online, you can also give to our missions to help give toward that. And if you have a child or a grandchild going to school, you can bring in their backpack or bring them, and you can bring in the bag, and we can pray over those next Sunday. Finally, one final thing. After the traditional service today uh, is also coffee with the pastors. And so if you have any questions about the church, if you're new, just looking to get connected, we're going to be meeting over right by the fellowship hall in my office after the traditional service today. So let's once again stand as we are able and sing to our God. I know a place where we can go to lay the troubles down in your soul. When there's a close, take the stains, make you whiter than snow. Like a tide, it is rising up deep inside a current. Find moons, it makes it come alive. Living water that brings the dead to life. Ooh, oh, oh. We're going down to the river, down to the river, down to the river to pray. Let's get washed by the water, washed by the water, rise up in amazing grace. Let's go down, down, down to the river. You will leave change. Let's go down, down, down to the river. Never the same. I've seen it move in my own life Took me from dusty roads into paradise All of my dirt, all of my shame Drowned in the streams that made me born again 
Like a tide, it is rising up deep inside a current. That moves, it makes it come alive. Living water that brings the dead to life. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We're going down to the river, down to the river, down to the river to pray. Let's get washed by the water, washed by the water, rise up in amazing grace. Let's go down, down, down to the river. You will be changed. Let's go down, down, down to the river. Never the same. Let's go down. Whoa, 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 whoa. Let's go down. Whoa, 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 whoa. Let's go down. We're going down to the river. Down to the river. Down to the river to pray. Let's get washed by the water. Washed by the water, rise up in amazing grace. Let's go down, down, down to the river. You will leave change. Let's go down, down, down to the river. Never the same. Go down, whoa, 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 whoa. Gotta go, gotta go, gotta go down in amazing grace. Down, down, down to the river. Gotta go, gotta go, gotta go down in amazing grace. Friends, let us pray over the gifts that we return to God today. Lord God, we thank you for all that you have given to us. And so as we give, Lord, whether it's online or whether it's in the back of the church or in many other different ways, Lord, we just pray that you would multiply it for your kingdom, Lord. Multiply it that people would know how much you love them, that no one is alone. There's a community where they are welcome. And Lord, we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, power, and the glory forever. Amen. So brothers and sisters, as we go from this space, may you know that you have a God who loves you right where you are, that you have a community around you, and we pray that you may choose life life to the fullest through Christ our Lord. Amen. Suddenly a grave 